Okay, this is my third and final China art podcast. The Wan or Mongol dynasty lasted less than 100 years. Basically, Kublai Khan's successors were not as able as he was. Now, the term golden age probably gets thrown around a little too freely in discussions of Chinese history. But the successor Ming dynasty, together with the much earlier Han dynasty, probably really do earn this label. And just to round out our dynasties, by the way, I should note that a final dynasty and another non-Han Chinese dynasty took power in 1644 and ruled until the fall of the empire in the early 20th century. Beijing's Forbidden City, which is our next work, remained the center of imperial power through this dynasty, but most of the essential structures that we're going to be looking at were established during the Ming Dynasty, and so that's where we'll linger. The Ming Dynasty initially established its capital in southern China in Nanjing, but the third Ming emperor moved the capital back to Beijing. Well, you all need a break from the disembodied voice, right? So, we're going to watch a short clip from a good National Geographic video about the Forbidden City. But first, before you watch, let me offer a word of warning. Your essay question for this unit, which will count as part of your semester final, is a question about the Forbidden City, or more specifically, this actual College Board question shows you another complex in Beijing one that's not a required work, and asks you to tell what work it resembles. Hey, I just give away that answer, but the question goes on to ask you to talk about the elements these two complexes have in common, which means you need to understand the Forbidden City specifically. You need to understand how its organization and buildings reflect some combination of two themes that we've addressed a lot at this semester, sacred spaces, and power and authority. The bad news is that this will be a strictly timed essay. The College Board gives you 15 minutes for this question, and so will we. The good news is that we are going to let you use one note card. So listen up, review your homework, and maybe do a little extra research on the Forbidden City. The entire video will be up on Moodle if that's any incentive. I've left out the sections with blood and gore and the sections about imperial sex life. Since this isn't entirely clear on the video, here's a map of the old city of Beijing. Note that there are three walls, the wall around the outer city, the wall around the imperial city, and the wall around the sacred heart of the city, the so-called forbidden city, which is our required work. Okay, on to the video. You'll see more of the video in a minute, but first I want to make some points about the sacred and political geometry of the forbidden city. This plan is one of the five required images of the Forbidden City. This is not. It's instead a labeled version of the plan, and it includes on the right the three specific buildings on the required list with their placement. Uh, your final image will be an aerial view. I'll put that up in a minute. This is not a required image, getting tired of these phrases, but it does show that the layout of the Forbidden City was prescribed by a rather complex Chinese cosmology based on a document called the I Ching. The Forbidden City is laid out on an axial plan. Remember that square or rectangular shapes represented the earth, and the emperor ruled over the kingdom of the earth. Like the pharaoh, he also meditated between his people and the heavens. It was the emperor's sacred duty to maintain cosmic order from his throne, uh, which is centered in the Hall of Supreme Harmony, which is placed at the center of the Forbidden City. This all symbolizes the emperor's placement at the center of the world. The Chinese call themselves the Middle Kingdom, basically because they see themselves at the center of the world. Note that the most important buildings all lie along the central north-south axial. It's an axial plan. Uh, this is all very rectilinear, but you might keep in mind that circles in Chinese iconography are the shape of heaven, like the Bai disk, and that is a hint. The Forbidden City is also laid out in threes, which is a sacred number in China. In Chinese culture, particularly in Taoist thought, Three represents the unity of yin and yang. 
Together they make three. So the private residences are in groups of six, three times two. The roofs have three tiers. There are three central ceremonial buildings uh, beyond the meridian uh, or front gate, and then again beyond the inner gate. So here's the last required image, the aerial view. So let's return to the video. Think about and take notes about how the organization and decoration of the space reinforces the emperor's dual religious and political roles. We'll head back to the video in a moment, but first let me make a couple more points about the way the Forbidden City was structured and constructed. Here you see the plan of a traditional multi-generational family compound in Beijing. Note that it too is organized on a north-south axis. The head of the family lives in the principal house on the north, and the other families are assigned houses strictly according to their rank. I'm not going to go into all the details. It gets very complicated. Basically, Confucian hierarchy also determines the layout of Chinese domestic and imperial spaces. Also note that while the Forbidden City buildings are huge, and the vast scale is a big part of the power and authority message, they are built of wood according to the same construction plan used for smaller Chinese buildings. Traditional Chinese construction is post and beam, or what we've before called post and lintel, like that of Greek temples. And like Romanesque cathedrals, Chinese post and beam buildings can be expanded by adding new bays that are formed by beams and purlins. The limitation being that a bay can be no longer than the trunk of an available tree. What is most distinctly, distinctively Chinese about this structure? Well, it's those curved eaves. So let's return to the video one last time and learn about the private living quarters of the emperor. The exciting parts, by the way, are on the video on Moodle. I've left them out. You won't forget about dragon symbolism or lucky colors, right? So the required image on the upper left doesn't show up in the video or in the Khan Academy essay. So let me just say a few words about it. This palace was built by an emperor as his retirement home, but he died before he could retire to it. And he decreed that no one else should ever live there and no one else ever did. This emperor began to build his retirement house in 1772, and that makes it a Qing, not a Ming work, a Manchu work. That was the outside dynasty that came in from the north of China, what's now called Manchuria. So I'm guessing that the college board included the interior shop because it's considered one of the most beautiful classic Chinese interiors, and it's now being restored. The emperors, as you'll see, lived well. Okay, I really am running out of time, and the homework readings on this work were excellent, including the original artist's analysis of his own objectives and techniques and methods. So, I just want to warn that this work shows up in multiple test questions. If you skip the homework, reconsider the decision. Instead of retelling the narrative, which is not entirely accurate anyway, I want to pose some closing questions that kind of sum up you know, this whole unit on China. How does this work fit into the traditions of Chinese art that we've just examined? Well, look at the landscape in the background, the towering mountains, the clouds, the mist, the highly detailed foreground. Think the painter knew his fan quan? And what about iconography? Okay, no dragons, an umbrella instead, but it's still a symbol of leadership. There's a lot of red, green, and yellow, or at least gold. In fact, I'd argue that this painting is in many ways all about the mandate of heaven, bestowed upon a new emperor. And by the way, note that he's wearing traditional Chinese clothes, and all the photographs of Mao that we see, he's wearing Western clothes. At any rate, as it happens, Emperor, or Chairman Mao, was in some trouble in these days. His reforms had unleashed famine and popular backlash, and he in turn started up a cultural revolution to restore ideological purity. And this tore the country apart, and his successors upon his death abandoned it. If you'd like to learn more about Chairman Mao, I've put up a great video on Moodle. It's entitled Great Leap Forward. I used to show it to my AP Comparative Government students every year. Alas, we don't have time for it now. 
My second basic question is, how does this represent a departure from Chinese tradition? Well, the original painting was painted in oil, not ink. Oil paint was very much a European material. The figure in the landscape, far from receding into insignificance against nature, dominates the page and nature. Fan Quan would be shocked. And finally, the painting and the poster that was reproduced from it, the most reproduced poster in world history, probably a reason it's on this list, are examples of a very European art style, which goes by the name of socialist realism. Now, we'll talk more about uh, 20th century art and political art later in the course, uh, but I want you to think about this, and in particular, I want you to think about one last work that will appear on the test. It's another global contemporary work. I don't have time to talk about it now, so I'm going to talk about it in my test review podcast. We'll, of course, return to this work in the spring, along with political art. But it relates so closely to the poster of Chairman Mao and to the Cultural Revolution that I want to at least introduce it in this unit. For now, if you have any time left, let's close with a clip about socialist realism and the propaganda art that the artists of the work on the right will rebel against.